Hey, good morning. This is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. It is August 20th, 2023. Thanks for joining me and all the people of St. Stephen in worship. We begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and in every season, whose word to us never fails, and whose promise for us is absolutely sure. Amen. Gathered together this morning, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your great bounty. So in the name of Christ Jesus, we ask that you would forgive us and that you would grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. So in the name of Christ Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. God is a cup of cold water when you thirst. God's offer for you this morning and every morning is an offer of boundless grace when you fail. So, alive, awake, standing before God this morning, Claim the gift of God's great mercy. You are free and you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth and proceeds from the heart, this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David! My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. 
And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith, and let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. So, this week I have scrambled, I have worked pretty hard to gather together some uh, payment, some cash here. 10, 20, 25, 30, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 dollars. I'm not a cash person, so I had to scramble to find 39 dollars. I have it right here. And I will pay this. I will give this to you or to the first person who can uh, earn it, who can uh, earn this $39, it can be yours. I scrounged it, it can be for you. All you have to do is send me a video or a picture or some kind of proof of you doing one job. And if you do that job and you get it to me first, I'll give you this $39. Did you accept that job? Do you want to try it? Uh, if so, uh, maybe you should have heard what it was before, but here's what it is. I would like for you to earn this $39 by licking your elbow. If you can show me a picture of you licking your elbow, uh, or, or maybe you're like grossed out that I'm saying lick and this is, you know, post-COVID, we don't lick stuff anymore. So let's not say lick, let's just say if you can put your elbow to your nose, to the tip of your nose, then uh, I will give you this $39. How do you feel about this? Can you persevere? Can you have enough grit and determination that if you just practice and stretch and work hard enough that you can do that task? Hmm, I don't know if you know this, uh, but it's ana your anatomy makes this impossible. You cannot touch the tip of your elbow to the tip of your nose. It's not possible. This was trying to coax you into this $39 and you could not earn that. You can't do this short of like dislocating your arm or something uh, or doing something terrible to your arm or, or your body or transforming yourself somehow. You're never going to be able to do that. All right. So that was kind of tongue in cheek. It's to say that uh, you could not by persevering accomplish the goal uh, of it. You could not just work harder and, and get that done. And I'm saying that because often I've heard this story of this Canaanite woman from the 15th chapter of Matthew, and I've heard it told as a story in perseverance. Born out of pain, born out of grief, born out of worry, if she just perseveres and sticks with it in front of Jesus, uh, that Jesus uh, in this text almost looks like his mind is changed, and by her perseverance, she accomplishes, she earns the reward. And I am about to tell you that there are a lot of things in life that you cannot, by persevering, accomplish. No matter how much money I put out here, by perseverance alone, you are not going to be able to do this job, all right? This is not about perseverance. If you hear any story or sermon about your perseverance, that is not what this text is saying. Instead, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about what it is saying. I'm starting out today by telling you what it's not saying, because that's an easy pit to fall into. If we're just uh, trusting enough, if we just try, if we have enough grit, Jesus will hear us and answer our needs. That is not what this text is about. And now that I've told you what it's not about, and now that I've tried to coax you into getting my $39 from me, I'll talk to you a little bit about what I do think it's about, okay? This has a lot to tell us about who God is. It has a lot to tell us about the inside-outside movement of the gospel. And as a matter of fact, if it's going to tell us anything about perseverance, this is a story about God's perseverance, not so much ours, but God's. We can't do this, but God perseveres. And God's perseverance, determination, absolute grit, 
to not let us go as God's children has to do with this inside-outside movement of the gospel. Internal, external, inside-outside movement of the gospel, which we see really pointedly uh, in today's scripture reading. Today's scripture reading can be broken down into two different sections. You can see it if you have it open in front of you. It's chapter 15, verses 10 through 20, and then chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. And you can see that that makes up two different sections. One, the first section is the inside, the internal work of God in our lives. The other, placed right next to it, is the outside, the external work of God. And it is the internal, external, internal, external, repeated pattern, persevering gospel of God that gets us to the reward that sometimes, no matter how hard we try, we weren't going to get to on our own. Okay? So I want to talk to you a little bit about each of these sections. And the first one, 15, 10 through 20, is that inside part. That transformation that God brings about in our own lives. And I will talk to you about it like this. I'll enter into what this is about. If I told you what it's not about, and it's not about our own perseverance, if what this is about is the work of God in our lives that transforms us, that starts with this part about how we're transformed internally. And now I want to take a look at it closer with you. This is about what this text is about, right? And to enter into that, I will tell you that over the years, I have officiated, I've officiated, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of weddings. I've done quite a few weddings as an officiant, and I want to tell you about two of those weddings. Both of them occurred uh, at places other than St. Stephen. But I've officiated at two weddings out of all those dozens and dozens that I've been, uh, been uh, able to be a part of. I've officiated at two where the start time was greatly delayed, where uh, at places other than St. Stephen, remote places, uh, something came up which caused the start of those funerals to be really, really uh, anxiously delayed. And in the first of those instances that I can remember, I went out to find the groom. The groom and the, and the groomsmen were all there. Uh, the bride and the wedding party and the, and the girls, although we knew they were on their way, thank goodness, were not there yet. And so I went out to see them and just sort of hang out and see how they were doing. And I discovered that they were outside, this was an outside event, hanging out where they had parked near a truck that they had taken to get to the service. And while they were waiting, they had continued in a process that they had already begun. They had been drinking so much that they, basically the whole back of the pickup truck was filled with uh, beer cans. And I can remember that, uh, you know, it's been a while, we have a little while longer till the bride and, the, and, the, and her part of the party arrive. Uh, you know, I, I needed to tell them, we're not going to drink anymore. And that's one of the one times uh, that I've uh, had to sort of walk this, this group through uh, a wedding where I waited for it to start. Another time, uh, the, again, the bride and the bridesmaids were delayed. This time they were delayed in traffic, and again, we were outside at an outside location. And uh, I went up to the groomsmen, and they were pretty anxious. And I discovered that they had uh, a box filled with little uh, bourbon bottles, little bourbon shots that they were waiting to celebrate uh, during the pictures. And they were worked up and I said, hey, how about we have one of those shots now? It's going to be a little while till they get here. Let's have one of those shots now. And if you've you know, sat with me through that story, and I'm talking about this first section of Matthew 15, you can hear that I was talking about uh, weddings and the circumstances were the same, but my advice or the thing that I said to do was completely opposite. In one, I was like, let's be done drinking, you've had plenty. And in the other, I was like, let's have a drink. Uh, what is it that has you make that decision? Can you, by persevering, always make the right decision? Can you just work harder or be gritty and and because you're gritty just always get it right never give up always have your nose to the grindstone of course not and that's not what this gospel is about but we do know who God makes us and once we sit in front of this we know that God makes us people who of our own accord filled with the Holy Spirit make decisions in real time in the case of that wedding 
for those two weddings. Uh, the idea was you need to not have drunk so much that you're not able to stand up, and this delay is going to mean you've had way too much. Uh, or the flip side of it was, you know, at this wedding, uh, you're not going to be able to do this if you're super uptight and so nervous that you don't really enjoy it or feel free. Let's loosen up a little bit. And I can't tell you ahead of time that I anticipated either of those situations. I didn't want people to be late. But the decision there was basically based off of, well, drinking and when it's appropriate and when it isn't. And that's a sort of, for lack of a better analogy, game time decision, right? And the first section of Matthew 15 talks about the internal transformation that God promises us in Christ that is a transformation from death into life and that that transformation is different than just trying to do the same task that's impossible over and over again, like stopping party people from partying. It's just not going to happen. But it is a transformation that leads you into prayerful and abundant living decisions. I don't know if you noticed this when I read from the 15th chapter of Matthew, but Jesus says something very distinct about uh, the heart. He talks about this in uh, starting in verse 18. Uh, incidentally, uh, Jesus has something of a poop joke here. I mean, if you've hung out with young kids, like your grandkids or your kids, or around any kindergartners or the sort of infantile adults, uh, you've heard your share of poop jokes, uh, and Jesus sort of has one here, uh, which is interesting. I mean, it's the Holy Scriptures, and here's Jesus doing that. But then he says that this thing about the heart, when he talks about the heart, he says something that should get your attention. Because you and I see the heart as the place that we, I love you with all my heart. We love out of our hearts. Um, I, I, I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. Our hearts are where good things come out of. And if we just persevere with these good hearts doing good things, the impossible will be accomplished. But Jesus points out, in fact, what a heart really looks like. He says that it's out of the heart. It comes love, and no, that's not what he says. He says that it's from out of the heart that evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander arise. You see, Jesus is talking about our hearts and the state of them. And while this isn't about perseverance, it's about uh, being freed to, even though we have hearts that function like this, be people who are filled with God's Spirit, and led into a right awareness of what's going on around us and an ability to, in a very faithful way, make decisions. I talked to you about those weddings, right? The difference was uh, the, the amount of drinking, the difference was the attitude, the circumstances, and it made me, uh, in one situation, say, let's stop drinking, and in another situation, say, maybe we should drink a little bit. One was because we it already happened so much that I was afraid the person's ability to stand for their vows was at risk, and more drinking didn't seem like a good idea. The other one was because somebody felt or seemed so uptight that I wasn't sure they were going to appreciate uh, the moment and enjoy it, and I thought maybe a drink would help them uh, be less anxious. You, you can't sort of predetermine that people are going to be late and which uh, attitude towards drinking you're going to have. But it's not the drinking or lack thereof that makes this event holy. It's God. And God knows that our hearts uh, are the kind of hearts that are capable of making bad choices. And so the transformation, not just the perseverance and trying harder, but the transformation that reconfigures us from death to life is a transformation that begins with these hearts that don't always perform how we should, and so we have this hope of not just trying harder, but being transformed by God and God's Spirit into something that may actually be able to be used by God to accomplish something holy. This is not a gospel about perseverance. It's a gospel about the inside-outside movement of the gospel. This is like that existential inside, internal part where we know the kind of hearts we have and we know that we need God's uh, acceptance and forgiveness to uh, be able to navigate uh, the situations as they arise. And this is the inward movement of the gospel, that God alone transforms us and that it's not about uh, the beer itself, 
it's about the way it's being used and only people who uh, God is moving through are able to make those decisions well, if that makes sense. And so that's the internal, the inside movement. But I said that God is persevering in the story, not the people, but God. And that perseverance means that it doesn't just stop at an inside or an internal movement, but it also moves to an outside or external movement. And from there, while we have this uh, analogy in the first half that kind of makes uh, sound like we're making light of blind people, in the second section of this, of this morning's gospel that I just read, uh, we get this section where Jesus seems to call a woman a dog. And that may or may not be an acceptable thing in Jesus' time, but at this point it's a bit of a head-scratcher that he could call somebody different a dog. But the thing I want to point out here is that Jesus himself seems to move from the attitude and the theology that he has at the start of this interaction with this woman to a totally different acceptance and movement through it. Which isn't to say that I necessarily believe Jesus changes or changes his mind, as much as it is to say that I believe the gospel is an internal and external movement, that we sit before God and our hearts are made pure or transformed by God, God, God's self, and that that transformation is not just for ourselves. It isn't just so we can actually get our elbow onto our nose. That transformation is a thing that becomes real at wedding parties or all the realities of life that we face. And in this case, it's uh, confronting somebody who's the other, who's different. And part of the way that this model works is an openness to allowing God to move in a place that you may not expect otherwise. And that's the external or the outside movement of this gospel. That uh, the internal one is that it's shocking that a heart can be the center of the bad stuff. We always say it's the center of love. The external part is that it's surprising to be approached by someone who has never gone to church, who isn't repenting, who doesn't know the scriptures, who is really from one of those groups of people that we're not even sure how we feel about, but that she can be called a person of great faith when the disciples who have been spending all this time with Jesus are called people who have little faith. The point being that if we want to do more than these weird things and if we want to get to earning uh, the prize or the reward, the only way that that happens is through our death. And death is a thing that is inflicted upon us. And it's inflicted upon us for our resurrection into Christ Jesus. And that is an internal, external movement of the gospel. It happens by knowing our own hearts and knowing that God alone can transform or renew us. And that's the internal movement. And it happens externally by being willing, even when approached by the other, to see that God's grace is uh, much bigger than we sometimes want to give it credit for. And that it can ask us to change or develop, and that this happens, and that you and I are changed or developed into full and abundant living. So if I was to uh, try to tell you that I wanted to start up a business where I rented VHS tapes to the people of Stowe, how do you think that would go? Um, I'm going to call it, uh, not Blockbuster, we'll call it, uh, uh, I don't know, something like Blockbuster. We'll have similar colors but a little bit different. And it's a business where I'm going to rent out VHS cassettes in, in Stowe. What do you think? Is that a good business idea? Do you think if that's a bad business idea, that by trying harder I can do better? No, because what's required is, at the core of it, a change of the business model itself. And this is what's true of you and I. That you and I are not going to be able to, just by working harder, to fix it or make things work. That the gospel works by transforming our heart. And that that's a thing that can only happen for you, and me before God. And God knows our hearts, and God offers us to be transformed and to move into a new way of living. And that new way of living may end up being shocking. We may end up being shocked by what we see or what we experience. But this is the external and the internal, internal and external movement of the gospel. And what it does is it takes us from a life of trying to rent VHS tapes or with a business model that just isn't going to work 
and it transforms us into God's own business model, the model that's been at work since the beginning of creation and will be at work for all of eternity. And instead of making our lives and our moments and our efforts about ourselves and the sort of dead end things we're worried about, you and I are set and transformed and moved, died and then resurrected into a more abundant and permanent uh, way of living with creation. And so this is what we are. I don't know if you're willing, but if you would send me a picture of you putting your elbow to your, to your nose, I'll send you this $39. By now, we've talked about this enough for you to know that it isn't possible. And that is the point of this morning, that this is a moment to gather before God and to ask for our own hearts to be transformed, to be asked by God's grace to be prepared for whenever we meet that thing that's going to be the moment of fullness and healing, that we can be changed and that the fullness and healing would be for us, that it be internal and external, and that it be the gospel. This isn't a something that we're going to accomplish by working harder. This is something that God promises to accomplish in us by taking a few moments with God's word and believing it's not by trying harder, it's by holding out faith that God alone transforms, that we are saved and all of creation is uplifted. Amen. Let us pray. God of every nation, God of all people, your arms reach out to embrace all those who need and who call upon you. We ask, gracious God, that you would, from out of your great patience, teach us as disciples, teach us to follow in the way of your Son and to love the world with compassion and with we ask this, fill with the Holy Spirit, so that your name may be known throughout the earth. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Stay safe. See you soon.